This is Dr. Ben White with the Rational Wellness Podcast, bringing you the cutting edge information on health and nutrition from the latest scientific research and by interviewing the top experts in the field. Please subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast on iTunes and YouTube and sign up for my free ebook on my website by going to drwhites.com. Let's get started on your road to better health. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you so much for joining me again today. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, please go to iTunes and leave us a ratings and review so more people can find out about the Rational Wellness Podcast. Today, our topic is sleep. How important sleep is, how much sleep do we really need, what factors affect our sleep, and what we can do to improve our sleep. We'll be interviewing Dr. Jose Colon, who's an expert at sleep. He's an MD who's board certified in sleep medicine and neurology. He teaches for the Institute of Functional Medicine, and he's the, he's the author of books for women's sleep, sleep and mindfulness in children, and sleep for infants. He's also the founder of Paradise Sleep, an organization dedicated to the education of sleep and wellness. Dr. Kalan, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you. Um, it's wonderful to, to be here, and I appreciate your, your podcast there. So. Great. So how much sleep do we really need? And I know it differs for kids versus adults. Yeah, so uh, of course, you know, sleep is, is important. It's a third of our lives and even more of that in, in kids. Um, uh, there's a lot of regenerative processes and encoding of memories and, and healing the body that we're having uh, with sleep. So it, it is important. And when we ask, you know, what, how much sleep someone needs, um, I, I have to say it's, it really is variable. There are things that, that we like to tell people. We want to tell everyone to get eight hours of sleep, to get seven to eight hours of, of sleep. Um, and, and that's true. That's a good recommendation, um, but it really is uh, variable. It's also variable across the different ages. I like things that are easy to remember. So I'm going to give you a couple of numbers that are easy to remember, but then we're going to talk a little bit more specifically uh, about bright. Okay. So easy to remember is that a 12 month old should get 11 plus one, 11 hours of sleep plus one nap in the daytime. A 10 year old should be getting about 10 hours of sleep. A ninth grader through high school, okay, your teenager should be getting about nine hours of sleep. And that's a perfect storm of a lot of different problems because they're asking them to wake up during non, you know, unphysiological times. When you have your eight to four job, okay, uh, eight hour days into adulthood, you should be getting about eight hours of sleep. In your elderly, in your 70s, um, we try to shoot for about seven hours of sleep. And, it, and it's not so much that the elderly need, need less sleep. It's just that there are factors, medical factors that, that occur that we get more um, sleep intrusions, uh, sleep arousals, fragmented sleep. But seven hours is, is a number that's easy to remember. Plus, it's normal to reintroduce naps into the, the elderly period. Now, all of these numbers that I gave you, you can plus or minus one of them. And, and many times it's, it's minus one of them. Um, and even then, having said that, um, different people say different things. You know, uh, Dr. Mark Hyman mentions that everyone should get about eight hours of sleep. And American Academy of Sleep Medicine and National Sleep Foundation you know, reiterate that. Um, Dr. Andrew Weil talks about how there are some people that can get less than six hours of sleep and have no ill effect. And he's right, because uh, interclass, International Classification for Sleep Disorders also does have short sleep syndrome as a normal variant. There, there are some people that get less than six hours of sleep and have no uh, ad adverse effects. Now, to classify for that diagnosis, you need to have no adverse effects, of course. <laughs> right. Uh, right. I talk to people all the time who say, I get five, six hours, that's all I need. But how do they really know if that's really true? What are some of the things 
that they might not even be noticing that could be affecting them. Yeah, so let's talk about consequences of uh, poor sleep. And we all know consequences could be cognitive. You know, they could be um, problems in thinking, problems in thought process. Um, there's, there's a lot of diagnosis of adult ADHD that is made in the, as, as an adult where they haven't had the symptoms before. Eh, that's someone that you really want to get a sleep study on and, and, and see how much sleep they've been having. Um, same thing with um, pseudo-dementia. I was, I was taught that in, in medical school that if someone complains that they're um, having dementia, the fact that they're complaining means that, that, that they know it, so they may be depressed. Well, not so fast. You may want to make sure that they don't have an un untreated sleep apnea that, that, that's causing that. Other factors. What was, um, what was that term you used? Uh, pseudo dementia. Yeah, pseudo dementia. Pseudo dementia. Yeah, um, and so yeah, these so, people who don't truly have dementia, they just have dementia because they're not sleeping enough. Well, they complain of memory concerns, but then they do um, a you know they they do the the cognitive testing and it turns out to be normal. So they they diagnose them with pseudo dementia and they say that it's from depression. Um, and, you know, to put them on an antidepressant. But, you know, I mean, it really could be an untreated sleep apnea. The other thing it could be, it could be a mild cognitive impairment, you know, because, uh, or, or subjective cognitive impairment, as uh, Dr. Bredesen talks about in, in his book, The End of All. And those, those are the beginning stages before you get to full-blown dementia, right? Yeah, correct, correct. Um, other consequences of disrupted sleep are, are insulin resistance. You know, so if, if you're seeing, um, uh, if any evidence of insulin resistance, unfortunately, many times people will just check the hemoglobin A1C, but fasting insulin levels, you know, are, are higher before that. So, so these are all factors that, that you would look into is there, uh, if they're not sleeping well, take a look at their cognitive status, metabolic status, and that can tell you if, if it's affected or not. Interesting. Um, so not only the amount of sleep, but there's also the quality of sleep. And I know there's the importance of getting a REM sleep. And uh, can you explain what are some of the most important factors in the quality of sleep? Yeah, so that, that, that's something that people commonly ask me. They'll be like, Dr. Cologne, tell me about REM sleep. And um, all the cycles are important. Um, people many times think that REM is your deep sleep, but it's actually a very active brain time, very active brain time that we're taking today's information and we're in, encoding memories in particular memories with emotions. Um, in our REM sleep, we also have uh, increased blood flow that, that's going through our, our organs. In that first REM cycle, you have uh, testosterone that, that is uh, secreted, but this is all in balance with your, your non-REM sleep as well. The non-REM sleep, just like just like a washing machine has a deep soak, our, our deepest sleep is at the beginning where our brain wave is, is really slow and we have growth hormone secretion, we have gastric acid secretion. So all, all of this is important and you have this um, really uh, rhythmic uh, setting to where you have this gastric acid secretion in the beginning of, that, of the night, protein synthesis, and then with our REM sleep, we have increased blood flow delivering it to our body for healing our body. So. It, it's all uh, very important. Um, what What are some of the um, how How does your REM sleep get disturbed? Like, can you get um, a normal amount of sleep, but it's just not the quality of sleep? What What happens there? One of the biggest disturbances of REM sleep is actually an untreated sleep apnea, and the reason for this is because in REM, our body has less muscle tone, so you don't act out your dreams. Um, it's a protective mechanism, but when we decrease our muscle tone, our muscle tone in our airway also decreases as well. So um, some of the uh, problems that, that can occur with REM sleep can be an untreated sleep apnea. Other things that can affect our REM sleep are antidepressants uh, decrease REM sleep, and um, you know, the, that's one of the, the major factors there. Um, another thing that can affect your sleep in general whether it's your REM sleep or your non-REM sleep, is light exposure. If you're sleeping with light exposure, some new studies have shown that that um, increases insulin, insulin resistance as well. 
Yeah, so you should have your room should be very dark. Maybe even wear a sleep mask or something like that if it's not. Absolutely, a quiet dark room is is helpful. Um, sleep mask can can be helpful if if they're tolerated. I I um was actually in Iceland where they had uh, twenty four hours of of sunlight, and I could not I could not keep that on my on my face. And I I you know I'm like ah oh, the sleep specialist I need to get the sleep you know. <laughs> but I, I couldn't keep it on my face, but other people can, other people sleep very well with it. Yeah. I've got one from Tempur-Pedic and it, it sort of pushes gently on your eyelid, you know, and if you push gently on your eyelid, it actually stimulates that um, cardiac reflex that causes you to relax. That's a good tip. That's a great tip. I'm going to use that in my clinic. <laughs> Um, so um, let's go through some of the negative effects of what happens when you don't get enough sleep. I know um, I was, you know, I, I, I listened to your lecture and I was looking at your PowerPoint and you talk about decrease in performance, you talk about memory problems. Maybe we could go through some of the more important ones. Yeah, one of the things that you see really early on is memory. And it's, it's been shown that sleep deprivation, um, when people do different uh, functional memory tests and, and cognitive tasks that they and they, they work as if they're impaired, you know, sometimes worse than someone who is intoxicated. And they've actually done these, these studies where they give one group of people uh, alcohol and they sleep deprive another group and they put them on driving simulators and consistently the sleep deprived group uh, does worse. So if you combine sleep deprivation with alcohol, then that's even worse. Other things that, that can affect that, that can be affected if you have poor sleep is by, by the way, when it comes to memory, is it more long term, short term, or both? I definitely, clearly, short term, you see some problems. You know, like okay, I went to the kitchen to get something. What did I go to get? Um, you, you don't forget your own name, but I, I guess <laughs> you know both can be affected. But immediately, you see short term memory issues. Okay, and then go ahead. You were going to say something else. Well, other things that um, poor sleep uh, affects and and, and decrease sleep. Uh, is your inflammation status. Um, inflammation and sleep are, are really bi-directional where inflammatory disorders are associated with more sleep concerns. But likewise, if you have short sleep, you have higher markers of C-reactive protein and interleukins and, and measures of, of inflammation such as tumor necrosis alpha. Um, that affects cardiovascular status as well. You know, so they're, they're doing findings that you know, when you treat your sleep apnea with CPAP, that that also improves your cardiac status. But beyond that, you know, when when you treat insomnia with cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia and in, in cardiac patients, they have better cardiac outcomes as well. I also can't emphasize enough, you know, the insulin resistance. You know, um, poor sleep really affects insulin resistance as well. So you can be working with somebody who um, is a type 2 diabetic or a pre-diabetic and maybe controlling their, um, let's say you're a functional medicine practitioner and you've got them on a low-carb diet and still they're waking up with high fasting blood sugar, it could be their sleep that's actually affecting that. Yeah, and same thing with polycystic ovarian disease. You know, uh, uh, likewise, all of those things, you're very correct. So it can it directly affect your hormone levels? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, for men, you have that first uh, REM cycle where you're secreting the testosterone and, um, you know, untreated sleep apneas have been associated with, uh, test with testosterone. Uh, that's, that's low. And then also with women, I, I mean, women have, have what, a 28-day cycle. That's the lunar calendar, you know? So, I mean, yes, it, it, uh, sleep does affect it, yeah. Um, so in men, is it more likely to affect uh, total or free testosterone or both? Or both. Interesting. Um, so what are some of the most important factors that affect sleep? You said you, you talked about light. What about electronics, EMFs? What are some of the other factors? So all of those are really important. The light, the electronics, EMF, um, every single study that I, I read about electronics and sleep. There's nothing positive. Not, I mean, nothing is, is, everything comes back that electronics really disturb sleep. 
But you asked me another question. <laughs> you asked me, um, what are some of the most important factors that affect sleep? Right. And I got to tell you that in my experience, the most important factor that a stress that, that, uh, that causes problems with sleep is stressing out about sleep. <laughs> is, is people, some people can't sleep because something's bothering them. And what's bothering them is that they're not asleep. <laughs> you know? and, and, and sometimes we, we overemphasize. You, know, you can't overemphasize sleep, yet sometimes we overemphasize it to the point that it causes sleeplessness. So it's important for patients to, to know this. It's important for them to know that, yes, we're going to try. You know, we're shooting for our seven to eight hours of sleep per night. But if you have a night that you haven't slept, you're, you're not going to drop dead the next day. You, you, you're going to be you're going to be OK. You know, if you've gotten those first core hours, the core sleep is within their first kind of four to five hours. If you've gotten that, you know, this is going to help you, at, you know, at least for the next day. Do we want to do that chronically? No. But some people literally lose sleep over not sleep. Right. So basically, you should say to yourself, you know, if you had a poor night of sleep, don't worry about it. And, and you know, even if you just, I, I usually like to tell the patients, look, even if you just lay there and rest, you know, that's beneficial to your body. And don't worry about the fact that you didn't sleep. You know, so let, let me add something to what you just said. All right. This is going to help your patients. Okay. Um, you're correct. Even if you're not asleep, if you're resting, that, that's helpful. Everyone has a heart rate. Everyone has a brain. Okay. And these are interconnected with our breathing. So you can instruct them, you know, if, if you're not asleep, this is a time to do some relaxation training. This is a time to do an awareness of breath uh, meditation. And when you do this, you're naturally going to start to notice your breathing. When you notice your breathing, your respiratory rate slows down. As your respiratory rate slows down, you're hitting that parasympathetic response. And this is so clutch because if you're not asleep, you, you're, you're, you're at this parallel where one of two things are going to happen. You're either going to stress about it and you're going to go up at the sympathetic stress or you can elicit that relaxation response. And then at least you're, you're getting the decrease in cortisol, you're getting the decrease in heart rate, and you're starting to relax. So you're right. If they're not asleep, you can have them do some type of relaxation response and they're still getting some R and R, some rest and restoration. So I've heard you mention the importance of breathing through your nose as opposed to mouth breathing and some people even tape their mouth. What do you think about those techniques? Um, that, so, you know, so sometimes we use chin straps so your mouth doesn't open if they have an untreated sleep apnea. People like to put tape over their mouth. Yeah, I don't recommend that. I have, I, I, I haven't, I haven't heard of, of tape over their mouth. Um, you know, we prefer to breathe through our nose. It, it's more natural to breathe through our nose. Uh, some people have some congestion to where they need to to, to breathe through their mouth. Um, recently, when when I was <laughs> recently when I was in in Lima, I told you that I had some um, some congestion from some of the the pollution that was over there. Well. One of the nights I woke up in the middle of the night and I, I had a lot of congestion. I had to breathe through my mouth. Now, chronically, you don't want to do that. You're right. Chronically, you don't want to do that. And, and if you have that congestion, ideally, you want to figure out what's causing that congestion. You know? um, do we have too much gluten or dairy in our diet? Do we have environmental exposures? You know, what, what can we do to, to reduce that? Yeah, I, um, I, I've always been a mouth breather for a number of years, and I took some training on breathing with a Boutico uh, breathing coach, and it really helped. And that, that's great. You know, um, at the same time, I also have some people that are retired boxers that they're not going to breathe through their nose. You know, uh, you, know so you, you have to work with, with, with clients where they're at. Right. So um, can you talk about sleep apnea and what exactly happens when you get a sleep study and um, does everybody who goes through a sleep study end up with a CPAP machine and what are some of the other concerns people have about it? Yeah. So not, not everyone who has, uh, who's goes through a sleep study comes out with a diagnosis of sleep apnea and even people who um, have sleep apnea not every treatment is with is with CPAP but sleep apnea is where you, you stop breathing in your sleep your airway collapses while you're um, in your sleep 
and uh, it's, it's restricted and you have um, less oxygen, it can induce cortical arousal, so it, it affects your brain. Um, and then the, the known method, the, the single best known method for treating it is the CPAP machine, which cushions your airway open. Um, but there's other people that can wear a dental device, a dental device that, that advances your jaw forward. And just to, you know, just to kind of give a, a demonstration, okay, if I'm asleep, my jaw comes back. Okay, you hear a snoring sound. Now if I move my jaw forward, now I'm not making that, that snoring sound there. You know, so these are very effective. And, and me, yes, they're very effective for mild to moderate sleep apnea. So you need the sleep study to see where you're at, okay? Um, but the compliance of those have been shown to be better than that of, of, C, of, of CPAP, actually. Um, there are some patients that the sleep apnea may be positional only. You know, so I do have some patients that I've treated uh, successfully with uh, positional sleeping to avoid sleeping on their back. You know, they sleep on their side and there's uh, positional devices that have been studied and, and have some robust literature. I typically tell people to get a full body pillow. When you have a full body pillow, um, you know, uh, that's going to align your, your shoulders to your knees. So you know what that does for, for your back, you know, preserves your back and lets it so that you can stay in that position throughout the night. Um, you know, so those are the main treatments. There, there are some sleep apnea surgeries that are not really highly recommended. There, there are um, yeah. implantable so devices. Just get those surgeries first. recently where they carved out, you know, part of the uh, back of their throat and, and, you know, tried to make some more room there. There, there are serious surgeries that um, I have referred uh, some, some patients for it and, and I've yet to have a surgeon in my area want to do it. They're like, no, why don't you go back to Dr. Cologne and work on that CPAP a little bit more. They're, they don't have, they don't have very good track records. I just had a patient, uh, see a, uh, a sleep expert who gave him uh, some sort of device that, uh, stretches out the upper palate. So rapid palatal expansion is something that is very well established in the pediatric um, group and the pediatric age group that decreases um, the incidence of obstructive sleep apnea and the severity. Um, and I do advocate for that. In the adults, uh, that is, I feel is an emerging topic. It is not being talked about by sleep experts. Um, it's being talked about more in functional dentistry. And I, I think that it has a, a bright future, but the, the sleep experts don't have the data on that at this time. I, I also interviewed a functional dentist who told me that he thinks that uh, a fairly decent percentage of patients with sleep apnea really just have vitamin D deficiency. Uh, I have, the answer is, Yes, vitamin D deficiency affects uh, sleep, uh, in particular sleep apnea. Um, it also causes an, an inflammation to where you can get tonsillar hypertrophy, which further uh, affects sleep apnea. Um, I had a patient that I saw for multiple, well, I saw him for sleep. The, the patient has multiple sclerosis. Now, when I diagnosed him with sleep apnea, and it was a, a marginal sleep apnea, but it, it was it was definitely present. It was present, um, and uh, knowing that he has multiple sclerosis, knowing you know the functional medicine background that I have, I I know that vitamin D can affect multiple sclerosis. So I got a vitamin D level on him. Um, I started treating him with uh, vitamin B, and his multiple sclerosis doctor endorsed it. Yes, yes, let's go ahead and, and, and treat. Now, interesting, something happened with his insurance company that they stopped paying for the CPAP machine. What happened? I don't know. You can't make sense out of nonsense, so don't try. Regardless, it, 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 got, it got denied. You know, so I had to repeat a sleep study on it. And when I repeated it, sleep apnea was no longer there. This was after uh, several months treatment on that vitamin D. How but much vitamin D were you giving him? Uh, we were doing... Um, it, it was, I think, conservative. I think we were doing like 5,000 uh, units, you know. Okay. And, and some people will say, oh, 2,000 is conservative. No, I think 5,000 was conservative. 
But e even then, you know, it was only that much. And it was after several months of treatment, we repeated it and it was negative. You know, so what was wrong? I mean, was my sleep study wrong? No, I mean, I, I looked at it, I read it. Both of them were quality and I went back and, and looked at both of them. Um, and, and the measurements were there, but he just didn't have the sleep apnea. And he didn't lose weight either. So one of the things that can interfere with sleep is restless leg syndrome. And I know there's um, some controversy over exactly what the causes are. And I saw one article that found a correlation between um, IBS, SIBO, and restless leg syndrome, which I thought was really interesting because I end up treating a lot of cases of IBS and SIBO. Um, can you talk about restless leg syndrome for a minute? Restless legs are uncomfortable sensations in your legs that are worse at night, worse uh, when you rest and they're relieved by movement or by mental activity. Um, there are many causes. And then even then, there's two kinds, familial or non-familial. Um, and um, there's many causes. Uh, one of the main causes that everyone with restless legs needs to be evaluated is uh, ferritin deficiency. And notice I didn't say iron deficiencies because you, you can not have anemia but still have less uh, ferritin. And um, if you don't have the, uh, enough ferritin, you can have that. What's the distinction there? So if, what are the main treatments that, medical treatments that people give is the dopaminergic medications, right? Well, you know, the, the dopamine re receptor has ferritin in there. And, and further, you know, uh, so C, low CNS ferritin uh, has been shown to, to cause restless legs and, and treating that. So the, the range is when you look at ferritin, you know, it says that the range may be, you know, 10 to 20, or if, if, you're, if you're at 20, that, that, that's normal. But if you have restless legs, 50 and below, you know, below 50, that's symptomatic, and you want to be treating with iron in those patients. Interesting. Um, so how, um, besides restless leg syndrome, let's go over some of the, I, I know you've mentioned a few of these, but let's go over some of the therapies to restore better sleep. Um, you mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy. What exactly is that and how does that work? Yeah, so CBTI is the, the, the gold standard for treating insomnia. Um, and CBTI is working with a psychologist that really kind of helps uh, retool sleep. That's what I explained to patients. Um, but one of the things that these therapists are doing is that they're addressing our, our attitudes, our concerns uh, about sleep. You know how I said that some people don't sleep because they're stressed about sleep? Well, yeah, that's, that's what the psychologist works with. They're like, okay, so what's going to happen if, if you don't sleep? They're like, well, if I don't sleep, I, then I'm not going to function the next day. Okay, and then what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to go to work and and I won't be able to function. If I can't function, I'm going to be fired. And if I'm fired, I'm going to be homeless. And, you know, I mean, literally, people with insomnia can have some degree of catastrophic thinking that, that occurs. And, and the CDTI um, helps out with that. Uh, and another emerging treatment in, um, in, in insomnia is going to be MBTI, or mindfulness-based treatment for insomnia. This was created by Jason Ong. And, and there is a perception yet misperception that, you know, we can meditate ourselves to sleep. I, I mean, yeah, you can induce a relaxation response for sleep and relaxation therapy and relaxation training is good for sleep. And I, and I teach my patients how to do that. But MBTI is different because you're actually doing a practice of, of mindfulness, an eight-week practice of mindfulness. What are, what are some of the core concepts of mindfulness? Non-judgment. So if you stop judging yourself, you know, that, that you're not asleep, you know, you, um, you stop, um, you worry about the present moment, don't think so much about the, the future. The MBTI has been shown to be very helpful for insomnia as well. Good. And, uh, what is circadian rhythm uh, training? Circadian rhythm and training is that we all have a 24-hour cycle. Every, everyone lives in a 24-hour society. Um, believe it or not, actually, our internal clock has a tendency to go at 25 hours. You know, so um, if you put people in a cave and you take them away from light cues, you disrupt their light cues, they, they stay up later and later and later, an hour later the, the next day. And what 
resets our cycle is that morning light and then the darkness at night. So I'll, I'll use, uh, and, and even then, you really do have some people who are night people and some people who are morning. You know, you, people have different circadian clock genes that, that predispose their, their circadian cycle. So circadian entrainment is trying to work on a particular wake up time with light exposure and you can even uh, add melatonin based on where their based on where their melatonin secretion should be coming out. When should they secrete melatonin? There's a very very helpful tool called an, uh, an autumn a morningness eveningness questionnaire. A morningness eveningness questionnaire. It has a German name to it that I can't pronounce, so I just call it the the morningness evening uh, questionnaire. Okay. You can go on there okay. and get it's called the Automec. MEQ, auto MEQ. Cool. Um, and you talk about sleep restriction, restricting your time in bed. I guess this is for somebody whose sleep cycle's all messed up and, and you know, if they're having troubles, you know, um, sleeping at night and then they end up sleeping during the day. Um, how does that work? So let's, before we talk about how it works, let's talk about what does not work, okay? So there are some people that spend extra time in bed because they want to sleep. And, and that, that sounds logical. Okay, if, if I'm not getting to sleep till, you know, I'm throwing numbers out. If I'm not getting to sleep till midnight, let me go to bed earlier, you know, so I can eventually get to sleep. The problem with that is that you're spending more time in that bed learning not to sleep and training your brain to not be asleep. So, you know, the key is to the time, you know, restrict the time that you're in bed until the times that we are going to be asleep. So um, that's what we mean by sleep restriction, as well as also having a very strict wake-up time, because that helps with the circadian entrainment as well. So another thing that people say is, well, if I didn't sleep until this time, I need to sleep in longer. That, that sounds logical, but it's, it's causing a cascade of, of problems that's disrupting your circadian system, which we have a natural tendency to run at 25 hour cycles. You know, so if you didn't get to sleep till whatever time, it doesn't matter, wake up at the same time. And if you do that on a regular basis, that's going to help your sleep drive, get to sleep a little bit earlier. So sleep restriction isn't so much sleep depriving people, although you do go through a period of time where they might get a little bit less sleep, but you do that in a way that, that they end up um, getting to sleep on a, on a regular time, uh, a little bit early on a regular basis. Now, that is something that I would do either with a board certified uh, physician in, in sleep medicine, or that would be a great period to find uh, a, a, someone who, through the Society for Behavioral Sleep Medicine, a, a sleep psychologist. Cool. Um, what are what are some of the most effective uh, herbal or nutritional supplements for sleep? You know, so whenever someone asks me what is the best, you know, supplement for sleep, I always say, "What are you deficient?" You know, so I I, I will commonly run some micronutrient analysis to see. I, I I can show you evidence that zinc has been helpful for sleep, that magnesium has been helpful for sleep. Lavender is helpful for sleep. That melatonin is helpful. Everything that, that's out there, I can show you evidence. But what is, what is it in your patient? So you run a micronutrient analysis and you look for a, uh, a specific deficiency. Or you may write, run an adrenal profile. And you can find that their, their epinephrine or norepinephrine are, are high or their cortisols are high. You know, that, you know, some ashwagandha is going to be good for that or some rhodiola. Um, if their cortisol is high, lavender has been shown to, to decrease the cortisol, run a melatonin profile. And if their melatonin is normal, giving them more melatonin is not going to uh, help out. If you see that their melatonin is low, okay, then that's someone that we may want to supplement with melatonin or have them eat more foods that, that, um, that, that have both tryptophan to make your own melatonin as well as also natural melatonin such as um, uh, tomatoes, uh, tart cherry juice, uh, walnuts. Yeah. You do have you done neurotransmitter testing to see if their serotonin or GABA is low? I have, and um, 
the context that I do that is uh, I'm saying, look, I've been seeing you. You've done the sleep hygiene. We've done the sleep studies. Um, we've, we've, we've done the, the standard of, of care and, and, you know, you're still having some issues. Do you want to do a little bit more? And, and some people will say, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's do more. And I've had uh, a patient that their glycine was low. Oh, all right. Well, let's supplement glycine during the, um, other patients that, um, their serotonin could be off. Um, I had one patient with excessive sleepiness that had high, really high GABA levels when we did that. Well, GABA is, is inhibitory, you know, so they were complaining of insomnia, but in, in essence, they were sleeping during the evening. It's just that they were tired during the daytime. And uh, we read it, the GABA was high. Well, DHA, uh, DHA can, can attenuate that response. So we targeted individualized treatment. Interesting. Interesting. GABA can also help with sleep, and some people use it in sleep formulas. Correct. GABA can help with sleep. Um, but also, if you have chronically high uh, GABA levels, which many patients with idiopathic hypersomnia can have um, uh, defective, overactive kind of GABA receptors. There. So just like many things, not too much, not too little, got to get it in that sweet range. Yeah, that and, and, and what are we treating? You know, so um, I, I, I get the question a lot, Dr. Corwin, you know, um, what's the, the one you know, big thing that we can do with sleep? Uh, and, and number one is not worry about it, you know, but number two is what are we treating? You know, are, are we treating, do we have an unknown uh, sleep apnea? If we have restless legs, do we have SIBO, as you mentioned, do we have uh, magnesium deficiencies, ferritin deficiencies, um, and even sometimes throwing in micronutrient analysis and also uh, the neurotransmitter profiles. Right. So basically try to get at the root cause do a careful history, yes, uh, do, do a certain amount of, you know, reasonable amount of testing, and then let's try to have some real targets for what, you know, that we can really try to intervene and, and get to those root causes, which is really what functional medicine is all about. You hit the nail on the head, Doc. Okay, Jose. So um, for those uh, listening or watching this podcast, how can they get a hold of you? And how can they get a hold of your books and your training programs? Yeah, so uh, all of my books are on Amazon. Uh, they're also from my publisher, Halo Publishing. And yeah, I, I wrote a book for women for, for insomnia called The Sleep Diet, A Novel Approach to Insomnia, which I wrote it at a time that I had no idea about nutrition. So it's not so much about diet, but about uh, different lifestyle a aspects. And I have, as I mentioned, children's, as you mentioned, children's sleep book and a book for infant sleep. And I also put uh, information on my website on, on sleep tips for free on paradisesleep.com. And are you available for consultations in person and, and over the phone or via Skype or? I, I do work for a health system. So all of my consultations uh, are within my clinic, actually. Oh, okay, great, excellent. And what, what's your website? www.paradisesleep.com. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Cologne. Thanks for spending the time with us. My pleasure. You have a great one.